Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on Advanced Object-Oriented Design and Programming. This is the last lecture in the course and it is about object-oriented frameworks. Everything we've been doing so far arguably has led us to this uh, goal of understanding what an object-oriented framework is and how it works. So that's what we will cover today. Um, the notion of components and then specifically object-oriented frameworks, the way how you interface with them, how you use and reuse them, and finally an outlook on tiers and layers of such components and frameworks in software system design. So a component is some logical entity with a boundary around it. Um, there are, whatever type of component you're talking about, some defining characteristics. Typically you have a good component if there is high internal cohesion. So a component itself is made from parts and these parts hang together with uh, some logic. They have high cohesion with each other. And then those internal parts as they relate to the outside of the component, uh, other components for example, have or should have for a good component low coupling. So little or low dependencies in the sense of that if you change those other components it has very clearly defined and limited effects on the component you're talking about. So a good component has a high internal cohesion, hangs together well, and has lower limited external uh, coupling. Uh, naturally, you can build components from uh, smaller components, and you can use components to build larger components. So a class, an object-oriented class, arguably is the, is the smallest uh, component. Um, compilation unit in some programming languages. Now, the word is used very broadly, but you need to listen carefully because it's usually either one of two types of components that are being talked about. And these are actually quite different. Uh, the, the general definition I just gave applies to both, but in practice, they are very similar and uh, they are very different and it really depends on context on uh, on what type of common component you're talking about because the full name which is either code component or runtime component is often omitted and people just talk about components so what are uh, code components well that's the source code so the code that forms a component and then runtime components are the objects and the data and the behavior at runtime, the logical entity at runtime. So of a code component, uh, there can be many different runtime components as often the number is how often the code component gets instantiated. So think class versus objects. And then again, when you talk with people and they use the word component, make sure you understand which type of component they are talking about, what the discussion is about. So a code component to dive in more deeply now, again, is uh, code. So boils down ultimately to source code files that are somehow compiled and hang together. And usually they even become their own deliverable um, their own file built from these individual parts source code files. Um, typical examples are jar files or war files, the .o files uh, for object code and C and so forth. In Java, most notably, it's the smallest unit is the, the class file for the individual class and then grouped into libraries as jar files, for example. And um, that's uh, the way how you make code available, your source code available and reusable, because you're not really including source code, say like in JavaScript, you're always compiling the source code 
and then the resulting binary code is what gets used and reused. So all the binary always needs all that symbolic, the symbol information on how to link to it, how to use its interfaces. Um, you can build, you can have one class, you can have a jar of a set of classes, you can create larger jars from jars. So next to code components, the compiled binaries, the compiled source code resulting binaries, Again, we have runtime components. So that's what we have at runtime. And these are the objects in the first step. So these are arguably the smallest runtime components. Um, objects are such a generic mechanism. They could be representing individual functions, but always the runtime of it, uh, the data with associated code, but really the instance, not the underlying code. That's that's the key. And also here, uh, a good object or a good runtime component has high cohesion of its part and low coupling to the outside. When you look at a system, um, an object oriented system, you often don't have a higher level of component abstraction beyond the objects, uh, at least not in the programming languages. If they exist, they exist in the architect's or developer's mind. So they look at a set of objects and think or know or have designed it in such a way that this is now the runtime component. So they see an imaginary boundary around that set of objects and uh, that forms the runtime component and then the quality criteria, uh, high coupling, low cohesion, and uh, high cohesion, low coupling uh, applied to that logical entity, even if there is no uh, code level representation of it. To make things more explicit, good architects, of course, try to introduce these uh, code level uh, boundaries, for example, by having well-defined APIs or interfaces and so forth, and they express it um, uh, going back to code components by putting stuff in jars. But at runtime, it really is dissolved. And it's just a sea of objects uh, calling on each other. As you, if you were to have an analytical lens on objects, you would only recognize, say, the uh, high high cohesion inside a component by uh, these objects uh, of that component belonging to each other, being grouped together with a lot of interaction between them and then much less interaction to the outside world or if there is uh, interaction with the outside world, meaning other components, it always goes through certain or some select objects acting as the gatekeepers or interfaces. So um, you can use uh, dedicated objects uh, as instances of classes that represent interfaces. Um, there are various means of how you scale that out. You can group things into threads. You can have things in processes going beyond uh, one program now uh, to containers. These are all reasonable mechanisms to draw that boundary, to make that boundary that delineates the component explicit. And so like, like code components, runtime components also can be aggregated, composed to form larger components. I'll use an example in this lecture and here, here it is. It's a simple uh, example from the financial domain, uh, financial services domain, a calculator of interests for savings account. Well, let's just make the assumption there's interest to be had. And you can see here um, uh, actually two dimensions, uh, one uh, going left to right, that will be the tiers. There are, there's a user interface tier with the interest calculator, there's a model tier with the savings account, and there's a persistence tier with the uh, data holder interfacing with a database. And we also have code layers where you have um, the UI widget, model object, and object at the bottom. That is kind of the system layer, arguably. Then you have the middle layer, uh, business 
uh, widget, business object, and so forth. That would be some sort of uh, application uh, framework layer, as we will see later, and then the application consisting of the interest calculator and savings account for the specific example at hand. So uh, the runtime components go left to right. There might be uh, one object, the interest calculator, built from three classes. There might be the savings account object also built from three classes and there might be some data representative object uh, on the right. So three objects matching three tiers. Uh, classes, as you can see, we have at least uh, eight and uh, within one layer, within the bottom layer, there are three, the application framework layer, there are three and the application has two classes. Obviously, this is a simplification for teaching purposes. So when you look at these types of code components, uh, once you go beyond the individual class, uh, you group classes based on cohesion typically, you, far you will find that there are three distinguishable types of code components, large scale uh, code components. There are libraries, sometimes called toolkits, there are frameworks, and then there are uh, platforms. So the libraries um, are uh, those code components which give you comparatively actually low cohesion because it's just a collection of functions or classes for use. A framework gives you classes which have a high cohesion because they have a coherent design that introduces the cohesion and then defined ways of coupling with the outside world. And a platform is usually a combination of both. It tries to give you everything to build your applications and uh, it's not just one framework. Sometimes it's multiple frameworks and libraries. So, object-oriented frameworks. Um, an object-oriented framework is uh, an abstract design uh, that matches a particular application domain or a particular technical domain. And uh, together with, its, with classes that represent this design. So it gives you a design to reuse and to use and reuse and it gives you object-oriented classes that implement the design so that you all not only get design level reuse, but also code reuse. Um, I said application domain or technical domain frameworks can really be about everything where there is a coherent design to be had. So the design comes first and then comes an implementation by way of object-oriented classes. Within the uh, idea of object-oriented frameworks, traditionally we distinguish between a white box framework and a black box uh, framework. A white box framework makes the design, the abstract design, available to users uh, as superclasses to inherit from. So the way to use a white box framework is mostly by subclassing the existing classes, but not just a class here and a class there, but always the whole design, meaning multiple classes in parallel. So you're subclassing multiple classes in parallel and you are thereby reusing the established design that presumably is very good because it matches the application domain and you're also reusing the code because you're now inheriting from existing classes. That code reuse is obviously achieved then by inheritance and uh, for this to work you need to understand the abstract design you also need to understand the internals of classes and their inheritance interface and hence being able to use a white box framework has multiple requirements and is 
harder or more difficult than the other way of using a framework, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. And that is often the call, the, the, uh, uh, because a white box framework is usually what you get when you design a framework in its early and have it in its early stages. So it already has a good design because you understand the domain, but you're not entirely sure or don't have it fully nailed how users want to use it. Your, your design is spot on, but your understanding of user needs uh, may not be there yet. That changes, not always, but often in the evolution of a framework and your white box frameworks turns into a black box framework. A black box framework is an object oriented fra uh, framework where you instantiate the classes as a client, you instantiate the classes of the framework and then use the resulting objects. So you're not subclassing, you're just instantiating what's already there. No subclasses, just uh, new instances. And you compose these instances based on the design afforded by the framework. The abstract design of the framework uh, dictates how you can uh, plug uh, objects into each other. Well, that's the abstract design. And the user of a black box blocks framework really does just that. And that is often becomes possible once not only the application domain is well understood, but also what users want and how users need it. So that's when a framework has matured or is maturing. That's when you go from white box to black box uh, framework. You can see it uh, here, uh, both uh, types of frameworks, white box and black box, have a high internal cohesion, uh, much higher than a library, um, where a library, however, like a black box framework, generally requires that uh, or lets you use it in a black box way. You don't have to subclass, you just instantiate the classes, some utility classes from that, from that library. Um, I'm not saying that a black box framework or a library never uh, requires subclassing. Sometimes subclassing is the easiest way just to inject some piece of code. If you subclass, just override one method, that's just fair game. But in general, black box frameworks and libraries are so mature that you rarely do need uh, to subclass. Uh, them. But there's nothing wrong with subclassing. So it's just one way of reusing both designs and code. The difference is simply that in a white box situation, you're reusing the design and need to understand its internals, its inner workings. In a black box uh, uh, reuse, also of design and code. You look at it from the outside and you see how stuff gets plugged into each other. And that makes it arguably easier and better to use. So we can see as we go from white box to black box, one of the old principles apply, uh, which we heard in the design patterns context, for example, suggesting we should prefer object composition meaning delegation over, over inheritance, because inheritance is in the end a bit too inflexible when compared with composing objects. So again, uh, frameworks provide an abstract design um, and have a high cohesion and low coupling, while libraries uh, may obviously have a design, but is much more, much more fine grain. You usually have to think about it in terms of utility classes. So there's no big abstract design and uh, you just use it out of the box by instantiating individual classes and using those. Now then, since we are talking about frameworks, the question is, how do we use them? As I already implied, maturity is defined by first understanding the application domain and coming up with a good design, but then understanding how users want to use it. And so we need to talk about how users client code interfaces with a framework.
There are three ways of doing that. There's the regular use client interface where objects call methods, or so client objects call methods on, uh, on framework objects. There's the inheritance interface um, where uh, we have uh, an object built from a class hierarchy where the extending code of a class has to know about the code and the superclasses and the inheritance interface. So while use clients mean logically there's a client object and a framework object, uh, the inheritance interface is really just how do you build that object that is your extension and that is the uh, code uh, composition arguably from using inheritance. And finally, we have meta object protocols, meaning a meta level way of getting two objects and manipulating and working with them. Meta object protocols are typically not framework specific, uh, but they can be made framework specific and are the third, less common though, the third way of interfacing with an object oriented framework. So, uh, first of three ways of uh, using and interfacing with an object-oriented framework, the use client perspective, meaning a class you programmed that is the client class, a client component, and that uses uh, an object-oriented framework for its design, for its code. And that is the traditional way of using anything. You call methods against an interface. The interface is defined by classes of the object-oriented framework. And so you program against these interfaces. All the goodies um, that we have discussed so far in terms of how to have client-supplier relationships apply. So the classes from the framework are an abstract design. Uh, it has interfaces. And as you program against these interfaces, you uh, can apply design by contract, meaning you have to be clear what the supplier offers, but also how you as the client have to behave. Um, the design by contract in total can be broken down into separate different collaborations. So as you use objects uh, from a framework, meaning you program against the interfaces, you selectively program in the context of different collaborations. So one, one time you have this purpose, another time you have that other purpose, and there's a collaboration ideally for everything. And also you use, of course, proper exception and error handling to indicate uh, violations of a design by contract on the one hand, but also simply failures inside the framework as it's trying to carry out what you tasked it with. As you design a framework and then use it, um, also be very clear, are you talking about value objects, are you talking about regular objects and so forth and also structure the design of an object-oriented framework using design patterns because the design patterns in the design patterns book and those that we discussed, they were all really derived by reverse engineering and creating an understanding of existing well-working frameworks. So the other interface is the inheritance interface. Uh, I just talked about use clients. So that meant two runtime component, the client component and the framework component, again, as the runtime components. And now we are looking at code components though, because when we talk about inheritance interfaces, we talk about class inheritance. So you can use a framework uh, by creating extension classes, by, by extending the framework through subclasses. So you really have a framework class layer and then you have your extension layer, the code you write, which contains your classes, which are subclasses of the object-oriented framework. You hook into its inheritance interface. And the way how you use the abstract design of the framework now is not by 
calling methods on it as you see fit, but rather by submitting to it. You have to conform to the design given to you by the framework, which implies that if the design does not fit your need, you can't really use that framework, can't use it well. It would be fitting square pegs into round holes, not a good idea. And as you're programming, as I'm sure you've noticed over the course of this course, um, it leads to an inverted type of control flow, meaning your use clients, for example, uh, call methods and objects from the framework, but these objects are interfaced with by way of the framework classes that defines the interface. But the object itself might well be an instance of a subclass of your from your extension layer to the framework. And so the use client sees a framework object, but it's really an object or an instance of an extension. But the access to that object is through the framework interfaces. And using polymorphism, late binding and so forth, the control flow uh, falls down the class hierarchy until it finds the most specialized implementation of the method, which could still be in the framework, which could be in your subclasses. And you might uh, also then call back on other functions uh, from your extension object, uh, from your extension into the framework, which does its job, runs the generic algorithms and calls on you by way of its inheritance interface. This is also called the Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. The framework itself does its job and delegates bits and pieces of those tasks of the generic algorithms uh, to the object itself, but through the inheritance interface. And then by way of polymorphism, you can uh, uh, override the implementation of those bits and pieces and customize them for your specific extension, your specific use of the framework uh, for your application. So as you design the inter inheritance interface or as you use it, you have to either create or be mindful of uh, the principles we discussed in this course, that there are abstract superclasses, that you should have those classes that are there to be extended uh, be abstract in the sense of that they are very clear of what they can specify in general, the generic design, and where they create the hook for subclasses to customize individual steps in a larger algorithm. And also as this way an inheritance interface gets designed uh, to make code reuse quick and painless, that inheritance interface should not be broad, should not allow for everything, but rather, oh, well, it can still be broad, but it should not require that you implement the full set of uh, its breadth of methods that constitute its breadth, but rather only a minimal set, meaning a narrow uh, inheritance interface or a minimal inheritance interface to get going so that your super subclasses, your extension classes, that those really just have to override a few minimal number of methods and get a lot of default behavior uh, for the rest of this otherwise possibly, possibly broad inheritance interface. Then if those default implementations are not good enough, uh, you should still be able to override it, but you don't have to, to get going with the framework. That inheritance interface, again, is not only structured by trying to make it narrow, but also by following established patterns that we've described uh, on the method level. Um, be very clear about your primitive methods and your hooked methods. Um, be very clear about dedicated purposes like creation methods, factory methods, template methods for generic algorithms and so forth. And since as a framework designer you want your framework not only to be used but to be used successfully, you need to doc document uh, how to use it. If, if you make 
the full internals of a class available uh, by, to subclasses. The programmers of those subclasses will look at your class and they will see in a type browser uh, how many different methods there are. And you need to be really clear about which are there for overriding, what is the inheritance interface. So document how to extend it, document those points, those methods in the inheritance interface that need to be overridden. And uh, you can achieve some of that by way of the visibility properties of uh, methods. Is it private? Obviously you shouldn't be using it then. Is it protected? Is it public? So in general, uh, protected method uh, being protected as an indicator of potential overriding, but that's really the minimum. You should also provide good explanations of how these methods play together, type them properly as just explained, primitive hook, factory, template, and so forth, so that by way of the professional language you learned in this course, users of your framework will understand how to use it correctly and hopefully be happy. So. Inheritance interfaces, there are plenty in the Wildside framework. Arguably, then, it is not in its fullest mature stage uh, because there's a lot of white box use. Um, here are some examples. In the main class, there are as a basic inheritance interface that you can find in many frameworks uh, at its core consisting of a startup and shutdown method how to start the system, put all pieces in place, and how to shut it down properly, let go of resources that need to be cleaned out and so forth. And these are established patterns actually also, where the startup method is, and the shutdown methods are available across the whole class hierarchy called bottom out, called from the most specific class, the extension class, climbing up the class hierarchy to the root and then falling back down. A good way, a well understood pattern of starting up and shutting down software systems. In between startup and shutdown is run or execution and that's where the actual work gets done while the application is running. Uh, you know the model classes, the photo class, user case handling classes and so forth. The handlers as they receive uh, calls uh, from from the user interface to carry out some function on the model, the agents, and so forth. Here is the uh, main class, the startup and shutdown example, as I just explained. Um, here it goes through um, three main levels uh, in the framework itself, and then there will be a fourth level, maybe your extension of it. And I, you can see how there's the abstract main, which maybe initializes logging. Then there's the model main, which makes the model and the photo data available. And then there are two variants of model main, two further subclasses, service main, which operates the wild side application as a web service. And then there's also separately the script main, which only starts up wild side, uh, creates access to the model and the data, but does not start a web service and then is used for manipulating the model. Maybe, for example, because you have to uh, update the schema of the database. So there's system evolution possible in the script. The script main idea is that you start up the system, you execute a few script steps, so to speak, and then you shut it down and after that you can resume normal operation by way of a service main. And you extend this by either having the wild side main service main class to just operate, operate wild side as a service or you have the um, update 2341 a database schema script main where you perform some massaging on your data uh, before you before you uh, shut it down again and go back to regular operations may not be so professional in our always on world to separate this but well still many many software pieces aren't hot updatable 
and so you just have a maintenance window where you uh, run your update scripts and then resume normal operation. So I've pointed to it many times already by way of the inheritance interface and the inheritance used by inheritance of a framework as in white box frameworks. How do you extend framework properly? So an extension is the classes, the user of, an, of a framework writes and User is a multi-loaded word now. We have the use client type of user and we have the white box extension type of user. So I'm talking now about someone who wants to use an object-oriented framework and use it by way of extending it, meaning customizing what is known about the domain by way of its abstract design and the implementation classes, customizing that to the very specific problem at hand. At hand. You, you have that very often that there are general models and then more and more specialized models. In fact, sometimes the world looks like there's a general model and then it gets ever more specialized in an arbitrary number of layers, each one being a specialization of the previous one. Any case, in any way, the terminology to talk about framework extensions is such that you uh, have extension points. These are the places, these are the classes and the specific methods in the inheritance interface that you override, extend by way of providing new implementations. Such a class and its inheritance interface is an extension point. Not all framework classes are extension points, only selected framework classes are extension points. If everything has to be an extension point, then the framework is probably very immature. Um, if it's a select class, then it's probably somewhat mature, more mature. The set of classes that you, the extending user, right, taken together, are form a framework extension. So it's multiple classes where you customize an overall design by subclassing multiple classes in parallel. As you do that, uh, you are actually subclassing uh, the overall design by way of the multiple collaborations going on. So you need to be very mindful of maintaining the proper collaborations. You cannot work or you should not work against the relationships and collaborations of the abstract design of the classes and the abstract design in your subclasses. Because most likely you're going to make a mistake uh, because you're violating the intent of the framework. And B, as the framework gets an update, uh, the original framework designers, they will stick to their own design. And since you violated it, whatever they changed, even if you think you kind of fixed it or worked around it, may uh, then break your extension. So it's not a good idea to work against the abstract design of a framework, but you should stay within it. And that means not just selectively subclassing classes, creating extension point classes, but really respecting the design and the interaction that you inherit and not work against it. This is best done by just overriding methods and not relying on the other extension classes because then all the control flow from one class to another from one object instantiated from one extension point class to another object extended from another extension point class all control flow goes through the framework and thereby automatically respects its design an object is a runtime component the whole extension of a framework, like the framework itself, is its own code component, usually. So the framework is a code component and the extension is a code component, but the objects are their own created from the framework and the extension are their own runtime components. So runtime component and code component are independent, are not independent, but they're orthogonal, arguably, to each other.
So here you can see it with the flowers extension of the vault side framework. So above the black line, you have the classes from the framework. Those arguably, uh, that arguably is the framework component. So it's a code component, those classes taken together. And then the flower extension, um, uh, these classes could be turned into one larger code component itself. And about these code components, we also view them in layers. So there's a framework layer and there's the extension layer. So we use the word layer to separate these code components as well. The, the framework is most likely to be one code component. The extension sometimes can be multiple, but you do need to understand that the whole extension is also one larger uh, code component itself. Objects, meaning runtime components, uh, are the other dimension, turn it by 90 degrees. It's the flower photo is uh, one instance also, one flower photo is one instance of the class flower photo and the code of it uh, goes across multiple code layers and code components, but it really is uh, one runtime component and so forth, for the flow factory, main and flowers. So use clients are so using by calling methods and subclassing by and using the inheritance and extending by using an inheritance interface these are the two ways of interfacing on a runtime level on a code level with a framework uh, these are the two dominant ways these are the two ways how a designer of a framework expects its code their code to be used by way of the uh, interfaces made available to use clients and by way of the inheritance interface made available to subclasses. A third way, as initially mentioned, is possibly the meta object protocol, where through the system itself you gain access to the classes and can manipulate them or extend them. Um, in the past, or for longest time, you could do that uh, in a very limited way in Java through uh, initially no meta object protocol later uh, the functionality of class uh, java.angular class being continuously extended and much later uh, but available today by way of Java annotations of how by declarative specification you can hook code into a framework or into the execution of a framework um, both both manipulating or extending or creating new code components as well as structuring runtime components. For that you need to define annotations. So you can reuse existing annotations. You can define your own. You can even create annotation types that are specific to your framework because they rely on the abstract design of the framework to make any sense. Um, but this is really, in my book, uh, last resort of gaining access and using an object-oriented framework. It's the high art, but it's also a fallback if the other ways don't work, uh, don't work well. Finally, I would like to talk about tiers and layers. Uh, this course is a bachelor level course, advanced bachelor level course. So the idea is you're a good programmer and now you've learned about advanced design and programming techniques. You may not yet be a good architect or you're aiming to become an architect. So that's why I started talking about components in uh, this lecture not much before today's lecture, but uh, in other courses on software architecture, we will talk much more about component level architecture, architecture styles, modeling languages, and so forth. Here now, in this final section, I would like to bridge from the programming or object-oriented design and programming level. I would like to widen the perspective on components and how to relate the content 
of later more advanced classes where on a more abstract level you argue about software systems by relating uh, the code level to a set later uh, more abstract level based usually on components. So back to our example, initial example of the interest calculator for savings accounts. If you have a simple application like that, like Vault site, for example, um, you have usually what's called a three tier architecture of a presentation tier, a model tier and a persistence tier. And so I very deliberately call it tiers to distinguish it from layers so that we are not using the same word for two different things. The tiers here are runtime component structures, a runtime component structuring mechanism. The tiers very clearly separate the location or logical place of a runtime component. There cannot be a runtime component really that uh, goes across a tier or it shouldn't be. Um, so the presentation is uh, one object simplifying the interest calculator object and that's one runtime component. The domain model, uh, that's the savings account object in the simplifying example also one object and then the database tier is a data holder object perhaps. So these objects, so there are only three objects here, but they are built each object, the code behind each object meaning the code component from which it was instantiated can be created from multiple classes because that's how object-oriented programming languages allow you to compose code by way of inheritance. So that gives you the smallest runtime component, an object, a whole class hierarchy, all the classes taken together. That's the code for one object in the end that gets instantiated from one of the classes or the leaf class of the class hierarchy. And so left to right, typically drawn, we have tiers here. Each tier has runtime components, uh, the components in runtime. The other perspective is that of the code architecture. So you have code components where you think about the cohesion between different pieces of code classes here and we see three again it's much simplifying but the principles hold we see three layers of code we see a platform layer a framework layer an application layer of code and arguably each of these layers is its own large-scale code component could substructure it into smaller code components arguably each class is a code component but what is not a code component is a class hierarchy. That's a, the instances of that would be the instance of a class hierarchy would be a runtime component, but we have no code component that is the class hierarchy because a class hierarchy here by way of extending a platform, extending a framework into an application crosses those layers. So the platform is a layer consisting of the object class, model object class and UI widget class. The, uh, data holder, business object, business widget, classes form the framework component, code component, and the application component is the interest calculator class and the savings account. Those are layers of code components, layers of code, where each layer is a large scale code component. So again, uh, we have the fundamental distinction between runtime and uh, code component and they are all getting stacked um, so in tiers or layers tiers for runtime and layers for uh, um, uh, code or static or well, design time arguably so the stacking mechanisms come with some criteria of how you are, have to observe it or if you how you might be breaking it the idea of course is that in a stack the higher level elements depend on the lower level elements while the lower level elements don't know anything about the higher level elements meaning the higher level elements can call on the lower level elements any call back or 
returning from the lower level elements to the higher level elements is usually um, uh, implicit. So higher level calls lower level explicitly, they know the interface. Lower level calls higher level by simply returning at the end of a method invocation or calling a dedicated callback method where uh, the control flow returns to the higher layer or higher level, but where the interface for that callback is known to the lower level. So they only see their own level. They do not create a dependency, code dependency on the higher level. And such stack, uh, stacking is an important thing to have in your mind as you're architecting systems. You may want to have strict stacking where the higher level only is allowed to access the direct, immediate, lower level. And you may have relaxed stacking where a higher level can call on any lower level. Uh, that is uh, a matter of your design then. Finally, as discussed a couple of times now, let me summarize this here. Tiers are uh, stacks of runtime components where each runtime component is one or more object. And uh, of course, higher level tiers can call on lower level tiers. Uh, lower level tiers can only return implicitly uh, or by way of callbacks to higher level tiers. I draw them left to right, like in the presentation model and persistence tier and layers, then our stacks of code components to cleanly separate this aggregations of classes where uh, each code component uh, where, where the layer can be one large scale code component, but a layer can of course contain further components itself. So you can aggregate a big layer from multiple code components and should do so before it gets too complex. So with that, we talked about object oriented frameworks and how they put together so many things that we discussed in this class. We talked about the three ways of interfacing with an object-oriented framework, of which the two dominant ones are the use client interface uh, and the inheritance interface. From a maturity perspective, using by way of interface calls a framework is the more mature way. You have a black box framework if you can consistently, consistently do that. And the other way is the inheritance interface that would be the white box use. You can use the uh, meta object protocol sometimes to interface with a framework, but that is more a matter of last resort. Frameworks, if you have an inheritance, well designed inheritance interface, get extended to get customized for specific, specific situations. So you're using the abstract design of the framework to make it work in your particular context for your particular application. And finally, with frameworks, finally come tiers and layers, so the notion of components then both runtime and code components. And we discussed how you form tiers from runtime components and layers from code components. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. And I hope to see you again in one of our software engineering classes. Until then, bye bye, be safe.